Hello, boys and girls. Welcome back. I'm happy to be here with you once again on PNP Kids. I have another question that we're going to be reflecting on. Today, I'm here with my friend Eve. Eve, it's nice to have you uh, here on the show. You have a question for me. Yes. What is your question? How do we spread the Orthodox faith to deaf people? Because the liturgy is mostly hymns. Um, the homily is not interpreted usually. I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever seen it interpreted. Um, it's all auditory, not all, but mostly. So I'm wondering how do we spread the faith to deaf people? That is a fantastic question. That is a fantastic question because it's true. It's true. You know, we are supposed to take the gospel message, the message of our faith to the entire world, to the, every corner of the world. And we're supposed to spread the gospel and spread holy orthodoxy to all people, to all languages. And so what are we doing in regard to someone who needs it in American Sign Language or something like that? You know, when we have Agape Vespers after Pascha, we have Agape Vespers on Pascha, you know, in the evening on Pascha Sunday. When we read the gospel, we read it in all kinds of languages. I think we do like 14 languages here. And one of those languages we do is American Sign Language because we have someone here on that day that can actually look at the text and sign it. And we love doing that. We love doing that. What we need to do as a church is respond to the needs that are presented before us. So just like when we start having, even here at our community, when we have more and more Spanish speakers, you know, we do what we can to have the liturgy available for them in their language, even if it is little bits of it at a time. And then if we got the pressing need of a large community of Spanish speakers or Japanese speakers or people who need American Sign Language because they cannot hear, then we would form a ministry to address that need. So the church is always open and willing to serve those who need that. And if we have parishioners that need that, then they would need to vocalize it to us. And we would do everything in our power to try to help them, to try to guide them. So if you ever have a friend that needs that, you know, let us know in advance. The best thing to do would be to maybe get them a text in the beginning, because right now we're not equipped for that. We've never had that need before, at least in our community. But that doesn't mean we wouldn't want to do anything about it. We do want to do everything about it, about reaching all the people. So if you ever have a friend that has that kind of a need, maybe share with them a book so they could follow along. And if you see them struggling, say, oh, you know, now we're doing a hymn. This is the hymn. It's in this text right here. And then kind of guide them through it. And if this person did become a member uh, and then needed that, then of course the church would meet them where they are. And we would see about having someone, that same person who reads the gospel for us with American Sign Language, or rather signs it, then we would have them sign more of the liturgy. Or maybe sections, you know, and you start little by little. When the apostles started evangelizing the world, you know, they didn't have everything all at once. There's that saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm -hmm. So we would try to do everything we can, baby steps, one step at a time. And then eventually, if we did have a pressing need with a growing community, maybe we would even have a liturgy that's all signed completely. You know, if we had a community and usually what people do that have a need like that is they'll start gathering together and then they'll form a community. And then the church sees we cannot ignore this. This needs to be addressed. And they'll do that. They'll have someone designated a minister in the church, a, uh, a volunteer minister or maybe even a priest who knows how to do it. They would be commissioned and said, Father, your job or a reader or whoever it is, your job is to stand on the iconostasis on the side and sign it because we have 50 people that need it and they want to participate, you know, especially maybe the, uh, the homily, mm -hmm. just like we would have someone translate and interpret and things like that. But that's a good question. And if you are particularly inspired and intrigued by that, I would encourage you to pray. Pray that the church can address that need and all the needs we have. Remember, that's one need among many.
and we are commissioned to bring the gospel to everyone. So God help us. Yes. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Father. I'm here today with my friend Nina, and Nina has a question for us that we're going to be reflecting on. So let's listen to Nina's question. Nina, what is your question? What makes people do bad things? What makes people do bad things? That's a great question. That's a great question. That's not an easy question, too. What makes people do bad things? You know, do you remember the story of Adam and Eve, how we live in a condition now that because of the decisions that they made, that we live in a fallen condition, a fallen human condition? So we have, as human beings, this propensity, this desire to follow our own will instead of the will of our Heavenly Father, instead of the will of God. So when we see things presented before us, instead of doing what God asks us to do, we have sometimes the weak, the weak will of saying, well, I'm not going to obey. I'm going to do this instead. And we get tempted. We get tempted. The demons try to tempt us. Situations tempt us. And because we're weak and we have a fallen disposition, we give in to those things. But no one makes you. No one forces you to sin. Keep that in your mind always. No one forces you and no one made you do it. We make the ultimate choice in the end. So we always have to be vigilant. We always have to be watching and being careful so we don't fall into temptation. We pray for that in the Our Father. So no one makes you sin, but because we have a fallen condition, it's easy for us to sin. And it's a lot easier to sin than it is to live a virtuous life. May God help us live a virtuous life. Thank you, Nina. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present Enduring Love, Laying Christian Foundations for Marriage. Marriage preparation, together with the sacred institution itself, has fallen on hard times in the post-Christian West. It is more important than ever for couples to saturate their hearts and minds with the glorious vision of holy matrimony presented by the church in holy tradition and lived by countless saints. Here in these pages, couples will find inspired teaching from the Holy Scriptures, the writings of the Holy Fathers, and the service text of the sacrament itself on how to live in a genuinely Christian marriage in which the home becomes a domestic church. Through enduring love, may God inspire the hearts of those preparing to be married and also those already married who would like to deepen their union and render it more pleasing to God. Available now at Amazon and Barnes & Noble.